So very good afternoon to everyone. Uh, welcome back after your lunch uh, session. So hopefully all of us will make this session very, very interesting. A very important topic we are going to discuss today on how do we enhance the participation of uh, women in the workforce. So just to share a few statistics and I am sure you have seen it in the agenda as well. According to the latest PLFS uh, report, the female labor force participation in India has increased from 23.3% in 1718 to 32.8% in 21-22. This is good. We are making a progress. So I think something to be proud of. However, when I look at another statistic, which you all would have read, India ranks 166th in the world with just 23.5% of women in the workforce. The global average is 395 So we are not yet at the global average. So I, I, I think it is not just about reaching the global average, but how do we become the amongst the top decile or among the top 10% in the globally. And ultimately, it's all about gender parity. And this is not something uh, good that we need to do or something which is a social thing to do. But there is enough studies by McKinsey, by Big Fours, which suggest that organizations or countries or systems which have gender parity or which have a good representation of women in the economy are more profitable businesses, are better economies. So I think it makes complete business sense. It makes a lot of sense to have equal participation of women in the workforce. So those are few things. So of course, I mean, our esteemed panel members are here and I'll request them to you know answer some questions, share some insights in terms of the good work that they're doing. But before I do that, maybe I wanted to take three, four minutes on what Vedanta is doing. I don't know how many of you know, but Vedanta is a globally the fifth largest uh, natural resources con conglomerate from metal and mining to oil and gas. We are also into technology, which is display glass, also getting into semiconductors. In terms of metal and mining, we are in aluminium, zinc, copper, iron and steel, uh, you know, and all of these uh, uh, metals. We employ 100,000 people across uh, globally, 80% of them are in India, 20% in Africa and uh, Taiwan also we've got some uh, population and some in Australia, but largely Indian based. Out of these 80,000, uh, 80, uh, 100,000 people we employ, 80% are basically on the ground on the shop floor, which are through our contractors, business partners. So there, I mean, there's, there's a very, very important uh, step that we need to take in terms of women participation as we speak. 
while across the company in terms of professional population we are about 20% gender diversity in our leadership positions we are at about 30% gender diversity but on the shop floor we are less than 5% so what are we doing in terms of you know enabling women participation in workforce particularly on the shop floors particularly in the rural areas so that's something that we need to uh, work on few things that i wanted to share in terms of the uh, practices that we have and i leave about uh, leave aside the professionals for a bit or, or maybe very briefly cover what we do in terms of the professional population of course there are special anchoring programs special leadership development programs special promotion of uh, women so for example if everything is equal uh, between both the genders we give some extra marks to women because this is just to make a beginning There's nothing right or wrong i know there has to be equality there has to be equal opportunities provided but what extra we can do to uplift the women uh, leaders but more importantly i want to touch upon what we do in terms of women at grassroots women at entry level so what we do on the shop floors is we've started few programs for example we call it project panchi where we go to the room most rural of the rural villages and uh, uh, and, and take girls or uh, employ girl, uh, or, or pick up girls for internships i would say uh, who are 12th pass who come and work for us on the shop floor who get real experience who get real training get stipend plus get to continue their education so this is very very special and close to my heart hence i thought i'll mention it we started with 1000 girls and we want to take this number higher another program that i want to touch upon is our nandhar project many of you would have heard about it we were talking in the break about our csr program but in partnership with the ministry of government uh, women and child development uh, this program empowers rural women through education healthcare and vocational training we 6000 centers is something that we have signed the mou with the government and to uplift 2 crore women as we speak 1.87 lakhs currently are already benefited and we want to reach a number of 2 crore women across india in the rural areas so these are the two things that i want to touch upon and of course there will be several programs and as and when i get opportunity as we prolong uh, the panel discussion i will pick up uh, you know some pointers and of course if there are any specific questions from the audience uh, so to get started uh, maybe <coughs> we can start with uh, mr lohit bhatia and i'll request you to maybe a little bit you can speak about what your organization is doing in terms of enabling uh, women participation in workforce but specifically one of the questions that i wanted to ask you what are the key bottlenecks that women face when entering the workforce what tools skills and qualifications are necessary to bridge these gaps so if you can just touch upon that and anything else you would like to share hi welcome so very warm welcome to dr blossom kocher we missed you in the opening session but uh, i just started with the introduction so great uh, so so maybe uh, uh, lohit uh, uh, mr lohit bhatia if you are okay you want to get started and then sure yeah uh, thank you very much uh, to fiki and uh, nsdc and ministry of skill development and entrepreneurship to put this together and to invite us here for everybody to listen in and uh, you know uh, discuss about this important topic i think one of the first things that i see across the room is this is a fairly diverse room so that's the that's the good part and i think that since morning we've been noticing that there's a good diversity across uh, this set of uh, you know discussions and uh, panels so where i come from which is quest corp limited we have uh, over 600000 people that we work with so that 600000 employees who work at about 4000 different customers of ours uh, they could start from a sixth pass could be a janitorial worker and on the other end of the spectrum could be a generative ai it worker with a post graduate degree and a few years of uh, understanding in machine learning neural learning generative ai and all the cutting edge technologies so we practically work across all the skill segments we work across all the education segments uh, we are a large skilling company ourselves uh, we've been doing that for the last 14 years uh, but more importantly coming back to the statistics and what you wanted to know about the women employment and i'll break it into two parts to explain uh, quest took a huge leap in diversity a couple of years ago we were at about less than 20% women at work and our chairman asked everyone this question that india is looking at vikas bharat by 2047 
We are the fifth largest economy in the world, wanting to be the third largest soon. By 2030, by most estimates, India would be between 8 to 10 trillion dollars, depending on what statistics, what report you are reading. Uh, but if 50% of the women are not found at work, then how do we expect to get there? And even if we do get there as a nation, what kind of workforce and what kind of society are we creating? So our CHRO Chief People Officer, Ruchi Aluwalia, she along with all the HRs in the company took an ambitious plan that we'll be 33% women at work by 2023-24. I am very, very happy to report we surpassed that by a huge mile. This year, March 31st, instead of 33%, Quest had 38% women at work. And we've reset the bar now, and 2025, we want to be 50% and more women at work. Uh, so that's the first part of the equation. The second part of the equation, which is again something which gives us immense pride, in our 600,000 extended workforce, which goes and works with customers, we have 102,000 women who work for us. We're just the third employer in the country ever to cross the 100,000 mark of women in a single organization. Uh, the first two being TCS and Infosys, both IT majors. But there lies another challenge in our data. When you look at that 100,000 women, they are on a base of 600,000 extended work. So we are not 30% there. We are not even 33% or we are just about 20%. And Madhu asked that question when she said India's labor force participation for women has been inching upwards. However, when you take away for self-help groups, you take away for the Anganwadi workers and the others, women at professional work still are just about 20% in India. And the challenge that we face when we look at extended workforce going to customers, these are manufacturing companies, these are bankers, these are retail organizations, these are uh, you know, sales and marketing driven companies and all. So for each one of them, we have to solve from for a very different point of view. And I'll just leave you with one thought and then I'll obviously come back in the queue later in the day. Uh, is when we're trying to solve for girls at manufacturing plants, it's no longer a demand issue. Some of our customers say they're happy to have an assembly line with 80% girls. And there are four girls, they are willing to come down even to a 10 plus 2. But the difference is when you're getting the girls from the uh, rural India, when you're getting them from the villages, the families are asking a question, where will she stay? Can you give her a safe, serene environment where all girls together can be there? And I'll end this part of my uh, you know, talk by saying, and this budget, the government has taken substantial steps to try and solve each one of these problem statements. And one of that statement that the government has given, that public-private partnership with the CSR-backed funding should be able to enable dormitories for girls. This was completely missing as far as India is concerned. So that's one step and I'll obviously come back later into the queue. Yeah, thank you, Lohit. And uh, I, I really echo what you said in terms of, you know, the participation of, of girls or women on the shop floor. I mean, it's the parents who need to be convinced. And in fact, just going back to the program which I spoke about, the Project Panchi, we actually spoke to the parents of these girls. And we gave them a lot of assurance because we had safety, we had security, we had good living conditions and good quality of life at our operating locations so that, you know, the parents don't have to worry about the safety, security and the well-being of their daughters. So I think that's extremely, extremely important and touches a chord with me. So thank you, Lohit, for that. Uh, so Dr. Blossom Gocher, I have a question for you. So before you came in, I shared some statistics with the audience. The world average of women in workforce of a country is 39.5%. India ranks 166th, right, at 23.5%, so some catch-up to do. What can be done to enhance the participation of women, both in rural and urban areas, in economic development? That is my first question. So I would like to thank Vicky and, of course, the whole group for the invitation here today. And uh, 
like what 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 should we do for the thing? I talk about my own self. Like I have a I am a woman who runs a runs an organization and uh, called Blossom's uh, Blossom Culture Group of Companies. And we when we when I started, I remember. I, of course, I was also like everyone else. I didn't want to leave my children at home and go to work. And in those times and in older days, we used to have a, a, a which was a joint family. I'm not sure everyone would know that it was a joint family. It was easier, easier for the women to come to work. But now I have found that, you know, after they have a, have a baby, we lose a lot of our workforce because they want to look after their children. And that again, I find that, you know, we have to really look into, that's what we have done, look into giving them flexi time, look into giving them also work from home, and those who can work from home, and those who can't, what we have done in our factory and also in our head office, is that we have a crash where the children they could bring their children to work because that seems to be very important for them and we lose a lot of our workforce the women because of that and so that has helped a great deal not only help the workforce but help them in their happiness quarter they are happier they are bringing a wonderful vibration to the office and so that is really helping a great deal. Another thing that we have been doing for them and for all the women, and of course everyone at the workforce, is furthering their education, which is a very important part. You know, otherwise they come there, they work, they go back, they need something to look forward to and to go further. So there again, we allow them to have an, an education, whatever they want, how they want to go, what they want to do, and that again is helping them a great deal, as well as their, you know, giving them an hour at lunch. I don't know how many can do that, but we do that. And we don't just allow them to have lunch, not just for lunch, but also to engage in their hobbies, like they can play a game, they can go out, they can go for a walk, they can do anything they want so that when they come back, they are feeling better and more rejuvenated. And I must say, that has helped us a great deal because we did lose a lot right in the beginning when we had started because of all this. Now in the rural area, I work a lot over there because I teach and I and, you know, they teach them skilling. Skilling is a very important part for me and we skill these women and I have found that, you know, we may build places here, we may call them to work, but they, a small percent comes here, a really small percent, because of the family, the mothers, we have had this exercise done with widows also, the army widows and other widows, and we found that they are not allowed to go out. They don't, they don't want to go out, they're not allowed to go out of that area, and of course, like, we are building the dormitories, that was a good idea. But it would be a small, small little percentage. What is really what they would like is to have something that they learn over there. So our schools, our colleges, I mean, we have to see how we can go there and build something that they can learn over there. Because that's what they want. They feel safe, they will come and they will do it. The other thing is women do want to learn. And from them, they can learn like beauty, hair, they could learn puppet making, they could learn tailoring. You know, they're very good at all that, but they want to do it. So another thing that we are thinking of doing, and really, I think it would be really good, is opening cooperatives. Like, just say we have somebody who wants, like they've had the milk thing. You can have it for hair. You can have it for beauty. They all have to do their bridal makeups. They can make a lot of money over there. So to have one where they could come when they can and go, instead of coming out to work. I know we do have this problem. So this is what we have been doing so far. Thank you. So that was wonderful, uh, Dr. Gocha. And I'll come back to you with a follow-up question, but uh, maybe 
Moving on to Mr. Mohammed now. I have a question for you. So, what are the good practices of German development cooperation to encourage gender equality in TVET? So, maybe some best practices or learnings you want to share with the audience. Thank you, first of all, for uh, for Vicky for inviting us, and uh, also for the Ministry of Skills Development for hosting us, uh, for hosting us here today. Um, maybe two words about GIZ. What is GIZ? We are okay. We are um, a governmental organization, a German governmental organization. We are implementing projects in 130 countries all over the world when it comes to sustainable development goals. So also here in India, we are working since, um, if I remember correctly, in the field of skilling, we are working since 57. So 1957, where we supported, or 58, something in between 57 and 58, where we supported the establishment of a first training center, uh, I remember in the south. So we are working since many years in, in India, and we are very let's say it's a, it's a great honor for us and pleasure to, for this cooperation. Um, when it comes to skilling, I think I was very happy to listen this morning, many times the word, let's say, dual system was mentioned, or Germany, or Europe, how the vocational training is done there. So um, this is, of course, maybe I don't need to, to talk much about it, but I think we are learning a lot of let's say how skilling can be done, and also how gender sensitive or gender equal it is uh, implemented. Um, the skilling system in Germany is very much based on, it's very much demand driven or industry driven. So without the industry, there is no skilling. Uh, everything starts with an apprenticeship contract from the beginning, uh, either for girls or for boys. and. Um, Corporates in Germany in general are believing very much in, um, besides the topic of equality, believing that productivity is only, can be better with diversity in general. So even when I was sitting uh, here and uh, I received a, a report while, while I was listening to the discussions um, about also, let's say, the, 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 the numbers of in the past, there was a problem in Germany that the numbers of women uh, who are going into upper, let's say, upper management levels are not not enough or not not good enough. Um, nowadays, we see that the numbers are getting better and better. That we can see that, in average, the number is similar, 30 percent, um, but you can see across the different hierarchies. You have 30 percent across the different hierarchies and. The aim is, of course, to achieve the 50%. The Looking to our company, for example, or GIZ organization, we have two members of the board out of three are women and one man. We are trying our best to achieve that. We are representing, of course, GIZ So, can you hear me now? Perfect. so we are upholding, of course, or we are standing for European and as a, as a German organization, of course, we are standing for German values and we are representing also in all of our countries where we are working, let's say German values also. And there are three principles or which are driving us in all our projects, uh, what we are implementing, there are the three R's uh, when it comes to gender equality. The first R is resources, the second R is representation, and uh, the third uh, R is uh, regarding the rights. So um, all these three R's should be somehow tackled in all our projects, what we are doing, uh, in order to achieve um, either gender sensitivity or at least, this is the minimum, gender sensitivity, but what we are trying to achieve in all our projects is a gender transformation. 
that more and more, it is more and more the normal that women are uh, seen in different sector as equal uh, workforce like men. So, and we are seeing that transition also here already in, in, in India, looking, for example, into the EV sector. It's a new sector, and when you are looking into major industries, you will find that already this is happening in India. Maybe in other sectors, not in the plumbing sector or whatever, it is not happening, but in newer sector, you will find that. And uh, this is a good, a good uh, development. And I think also at the same time, the government took up many interesting initiatives like um, the loans for the skilling loans or let's say supporting the hostels and the hostel development, etc. I think these are all important initiatives which are supporting women going more and more into the skilling and workforce of new kind of jobs. Yeah. Wonderful, uh, Mohammed. I think uh, thanks for sharing those best practices and learnings. Uh, I, I think a lot of it is happening uh, already in Indian pockets, but uh, way to go and uh, I think you could learn a lot from those examples you shared. So now moving on to Dr. Sena. Uh, maybe the first question I have for you is, how can the existing government initiatives be dovetailed with the industry efforts to enhance the participation of women learners in the vocational trades through IDIs, polytechnics, further education institutes? So if you could help us with that. Thank you, ma'am. First of all, I would like to thank Vicky for providing me the opportunity. I am representing this work, the National Institute for Entrepreneurship and Small Business Development under Ministry of Skill Development and Entrepreneurship. Uh, you have asked very relevant question, and uh, I believe that industry has a very big role to play uh, to promote skilling and entrepreneurship, of course. Uh, you may recall that a few days ago, Ministry has uh, uh, invited uh, industries to stakeholder con consultation, for stakeholder consultation. I mean, um, there is uh, an announcement, budget announcement, that we'll have to make our ITIs as model ITIs, where the role of industry is very important for uh, uh, infrastructure, pro for providing infrastructure, on-the-job training, uh, designing curriculum, especially uh, industry relevant curriculum. So, I mean, uh, as the first panelist said, that uh, PPP mode, is very important. Uh, if we'll have to achieve the bigger target, then it is very much important for all of us to work in collaboration. We'll have to create network of networks. We cannot work in isolation to promote or to empower women or people of our country uh, to uh, skilling and entrepreneurship. Since I am from entrepreneurship division of the ministry, I believe that uh, industry's intervention in uh, handholding and mentoring, they can become mentor for uh, the uh, budding entrepreneurs as well as existing entrepreneurs since they have a lot of experience with them. We, uh, as a part of our training program, national or international training program, we take our participant for exposure visit to various industries. So, uh, I mean, uh, exposure to the budding entrepreneur to the industry is very important. Similarly, on the job training, if they will learn from successful entrepreneur or uh, entrepreneur who has faced various challenges, then definitely it will encourage them, motivate them to become uh, entrepreneur, to become job creators rather than job seekers. Uh, 
So I believe that industry has very big role to play. And uh, we believe that the support of industry to promote entrepreneurship is very important. And uh, we are taking the support of uh, industries to promote entrepreneurship. And in the future also, we'll continue the support to promote Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Poonam Sana. And I think uh, one thing which touched uh, my heart was how can we create or how can we make them job creators rather than you know, job seekers. So I, I, I think that's wonderful. And the whole industry has been doing that. So moving on, uh, maybe uh, uh, Dr. Pocher, if I come back to you. Uh, while you did cover, but maybe specifically if you can cover what policy can be initiated uh, or better implemented to support women and ensure they remain in the workforce. Because you did touch upon women dropping out at various stages of their life, uh, you know, as they go through the life cycle. So what could be some policies that, you know, we could introduce? The policies that we should put in place, of course, make it easier for them because, you know, that's what I really believe in. We have to make it easier for them. And we have to see that they can take family means means a very important part of them. And they have to, I have seen from when people working in artists, they have to look after not only the, their jobs, but they also have to look after their families and their children and everything. One thing I believe is we have to have crashes everywhere in a workforce. That is something that really should be there. Take a group, a small crash, and make that the thing so that you don't lose well out. I know a lot of them, they, we have lost, and so we have started these crashes, especially for factory workers and also in the corporate sector. That is a very important part. Another one is give them also skill them on the job. This is important because I feel they need to be skilled on the job. They should feel important so that they can, you know, really upskill themselves and not just feel it becomes a monotony that they're just going and doing that work and coming back. And uh, another, make everything, make the workforce a little more fun and interesting for them. That is very interesting. That is important. And one thing that I have heard that they, well, before they go home, one is when they work, with us, work. then they go home. They have to cut off work, you know, and take on the role of a wife or a mother at home. And very often, that seems to be a little difficult. So what I really feel that we should implement is that before they, before you cut off your work, cut it off earlier, maybe half an hour earlier, so that they could be you know, a little bit of chit chat and thing among them, and not that they go home with this whole load of work, and then and if you are talking to them and talk, and you know, decide, just, and it shouldn't be work that they have, and then when they go home, you will find that they are, you know, able to manage the work, and they have to manage their their workforce and their family. This is a very important part that they have to do. So these are things and. Uh, yeah. These are things that I really think we should we should implement into that. Yeah. Sorry, we are filled with one mic, so but thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kochan. Mr. Patel, do you have anything to add on this topic in terms of what, what else can be yeah, done? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I I just take on from where Dr. Kochan made those uh, comments. Uh, we firmly believe that women inherently have four times in their life when you know. This is the M factor for women which impacts. There's a marriage, there's a maternity, there is a motherhood, and there is a medical care. Now, every time that happens, most often than not, it's the woman who has to step up uh, to take care of any of these eventualities at home. And that means that they have to step back from the corporate career or the corporate ladder. So, just to recognize this fact, at Quest we ran a couple of years ago a program called Queen. That's uh, Quest, uh, that's Q-W-E-E-N. So Quest Women Engagement Empowerment Network. We first started with a woman to a woman buddy 
and a mentor. So we said a senior woman leader will mentor a young girl who's come to work. She may be getting into a marriage age few years later. She may get into maternity. This senior leader will navigate and help this person and tell this person it's not just about when you want the break. It's about how do you re-enter the workforce. So to enable that, we also said if a girl takes a break, let's say for a year or two years and comes back to work, she is not at a disadvantage to anybody else because the rest of your peer group traditionally moves upwards. And if the women have taken four such breaks in their life, in their career, they are behind at least four promotions or four levels. So this budding system and this mentoring system continues to ensure not, not only do they come back, but they are also put where they are supposed to be. Uh, we also have economic and social psychological uh, you know, help and counsel. So economic because we are trying to also tell the women leaders and the women employees that the money that you make, what can you do with it, how do you invest it, where can you invest it, what are the various avenues and imagine if you were to work for 5, 8 or 10 years, you know, what kind of corpus do you create for yourself. So you have financial freedom, financial independence. This becomes even more important when we deal with young girls who are extended workforce the ones I was talking about earlier who come from rural India or who come from villages. Typically, when we ask these young girls, Aap kaam karne aare ho, what do you want to do? The 50% of the times the answer is, I want to work for one or two years so that my family doesn't push me to get married earlier. Uh, and that's the only reason that they're coming to work for one or two years. Now we try to change that mindset and we counsel them and say, imagine if you were to work for six years. Obviously, as an employer, as an organization, we cannot tell them to defer marriage till 24. But the net result of trying to work for six years to create a corpus is eventually they land up deferring marriage. And that's good for the woman. It's good that, you know, it's not an early marriage. It's not an early, uh, you know, motherhood and the other uh, factors associated with it. So one thing leads to another. But if you have a complete program around it, then the engagement levels completely skyrocket. I think we still haven't reached the place where we can say that at leadership we have the same 38% or in future 50%. Unfortunately at leadership we are also at just 11%. But we are just a 17 year old company which has reached where it has reached. Maybe in another 17 we probably as the young girls of the organization the 38% which will eventually become 50% as they start to come back to work every time uh, at leadership also we'll have the same, you know, the diversity. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Bhatia. And uh, another policy, at least that we have in my company, which I can share is the spouse policy. Because when we are in remote locations, particularly in plant locations, if we can give opportunity to the husbands of the women or vice versa, wives of the women, I mean, the family is more settled there. We will not have attrition because of, you know, they getting married, so I mean, the spouse can also be employed, of course, on merit, but what facilities we can provide. And in addition to that, of course, the schooling, the medical, that entire infrastructure has to be there. And I really like your 4M model, which I'm going to use going forward. And, and, and one more thing that, uh, you know, I want to speak about is women in leadership. Absolutely important, because if we do not do that, down the line, the numbers, I mean, we will not be able to achieve gender parity. So somewhere I think we need to make a conscious decision and somewhere take a bet on our women leaders in organization, in corporates. And at least in Vedanta we do that. And I'm uh, sorry to be saying and know this thing to the men sitting here in the room. But even if our women are 60-70% ready, we take a bet and give them a chance. Saying nothing will happen, we are an asset based company. We are there to anchor them, we are there to support them, we are there to mentor them and they will be successful. I think we have to take those bets. Absolutely. And, and, and I think... Uh you can have a policy in your organization and then there is an implementation and an execution. So two years ago when our CHRO said from 20% she wants to go to 33 and then eventually to 50, we realized in the early three months enough girls were not getting interviewed and were not getting positions which they could have ideally got. There was a bias, a natural bias towards men. Okay, because men were majority of the managers who were hiring. So the CHR was slipped in a very simple thing in the KRA of every business head and CEO says that if you don't have 20, uh, I mean you will have 25% weightage of your annual appraisal and increments and benefits 
incentives if you get to the point of 33% girls. Next morning, everything changed. People started interviewing more girls and started giving them more offers. So sometimes you have to, you know, you have to make a policy, but then you have to also back it up with, with organizational discipline to do it. Absolutely, and, and, and it's well said that if it is not in your KPI or KRA, it will never get done. But, but Mohan, coming back to you, how can existing government initiatives and global industries be better aligned with industry efforts to enhance the participation of women? So maybe uh, just to allow you me know, two words about the last question, also about the policy topic. So, um, so looking also from the skilling perspective, because it's very much what I want to employment, but we need also the current the current figures show that there are also not enough girls and women going into skilling, into vocational training. So how to tackle that? Maybe also this is uh, something what we can look into. And looking again back to the topic of resources, how let's say how can be sponsorships maybe uh, being taken into account when we are talking about bringing more women into skilling and uh, many companies are doing that already because they need more more girls to go into apprenticeships but also into vocational training um, but also how what kind of uh, resource can be allocated to vocational training centers um, Often it is like that you you don't have the right equipment. So we when we are talking about equality, there should be also equality in regard of the equipment or tools what we are using. Uh, you can you, you can visit different companies in, in India especially, and you will see shop floors which are specially designed for women, um, and they are really very innovative. It's not a cost issue. It's not a big cost issue, but it's helping to get more women into these jobs. Also another thing, this is maybe also an interesting thing, interesting thing which was implemented in Germany where also in Germany many industries suffered. Okay, you cannot get a plumber so easy to, to, to uh, as a woman or an electrician. Germany is, by the way, one of the countries which is suffering uh, very strong from a shortage of labor force. So, uh, and uh, for that reason, Germany is looking also to India and other countries. But when you're looking, uh, and therefore the topic of women or how to get women or have gender equality in companies is very, very much on the agenda. And um, there are huge in initiatives, um, uh, promotion initiatives in Germany in order how to attract more girls into unconventional jobs or un, uh, how it's called, uh, untypical jobs. And um, there are very funny uh, uh, um, promotional videos you can find everywhere, which attract everyone, and um, and it helps. And uh, the government is spending so much money only on the promotion, only on making these jobs more attractive and changing the mindset. Um, also, when when it comes to the to the rights, let's say, also the topic of the rights, uh, anti-discrimination topics. Yeah, how to you. So there should be in companies how companies could maybe have a policy, internal policy, HR policy, which are focusing more on having, or let's say having no discrimination. This would be also much helpful. Uh, and the representation. I think I hear about the curriculum development topic or trainers, etc. So curriculum development should be also from the beginning. Who is sitting in a committee? Who is developing this curriculum? Who is developing the training materials? Who are the trainers? Who are the role models, etc.? I think that's also an important point which needs to be tackled when we're looking into policies and how to support getting more girls. Just one point on the, um, let's say, how both sides could work better together. You mentioned this question of um, how industry and government could work better together. So I think when it comes to skilling, it must be. It's not only about the education, but it should be also about making it more attractive and making it more, let's say, um, um, let's say equal, etc. Also, there both sides need to work together, and um, we think that um, similar like the dual system in Germany, uh, the, 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 let's say, all partners need to sit together and to identify the relevant solution, maybe also according or relevant for different regions.
the country, especially India, is a, is a huge country and there are so many diverse, um, let's say, circumstances that we need, we cannot maybe come up with one solution, we maybe need a little bit also to look into different, um, uh, different regions. While going to our partners in India, seeing and, and, and discussing with them what could be good solutions to get more girls into jobs, so one of um, the biggest companies said, okay, you can talk about everything, security, transportation, but the only solution I tell you is hostels. We need to create hostels. Uh, they need to be safe, they need to have a safe space, etc. Others, smaller companies, put joint forces in order to have, let's say, childcare. Um, so what I want to say is the, the, the joint cooperation, the private sector is doing a lot of things. The government's also doing a lot of things. But we think it would be the, the best thing is to put both coming together, having a discussion on regional level, on sectoral level also, to see the, the, the needs for specific sectors and joining joint uh, or, or developing joint um, actions, policy recommendations, etc. Thank you, Mohamed, for that uh, very, very insightful. Uh, so, Dr. Sena, uh, coming to you with another question. What role does entrepreneurship education play in supporting women to stay in the workforce and the kind of initiatives, and what kind of initiatives can promote this? You covered in some way, but we'll be able to hear more on this. Thank you. In fact, entrepreneurship education play a very significant role in promoting women entrepreneurship, number one. Uh, by creating awareness or by conducting entrepreneurship development program, normally we used to make them aware about themselves. They are not aware about themselves, about their capabilities, their strengths and weaknesses. So after attending the program, training program, they know about themselves and accordingly they select goal for themselves, slightly difficult but achievable. I tell you a story, one lady at the age of 60, she started her enterprise and when she was planning to start, she got a lot of resistance from her family member. They said, Mommy, this age mein kuch karogi, zyada padhi likhi nahi ho, bejati ho jayegi. So she, she attended the training program and after attending the training, she started her paper and uh, paper uh, cup and plate unit. Then uh, she jumped into food processing, now in Hojri. And she was telling that uh, at one point of time, she had not enough money to feed her family and now she is well off. Number one, creating awareness about her, building the confidence level. Number two is to tell them about the opportunities available. What are the opportunities available in the environment or how they can convert challenges into the opportunities. Number three, support ecosystem. I mean, there are various schemes to promote women entrepreneurs. But generally, I mean, it is not uh, only the case of women. I have seen in my 30 years of uh, service that our youth, they are not aware about uh, entrepreneurship, about various scheme of government of India or state government. They are running after the jobs. That is the main problem with them. So entrepreneurship education is very much important to tell them about the entrepreneurial ecosystem available to support entrepreneur and at the same time how to grab the opportunity, how to prepare a bankable business plan, how to file loan application. Uh, we also encourage them to go online so that if banker, banker will reject their application, they'll have to reject the application giving the reasons. So 
basic of enterprise management, financial literacy, digital literacy. I mean, by organizing such type of training program or by giving them entrepreneurial education, creating awareness, this is very uh, important and uh, you can see the total personality of the person has been changed and we also prefer to provide them mentoring and handholding support up to six months because after the training we have seen that after the training when uh, they go to the field they face teething problems at different levels with their mother registration or bank uh, loan uh, filing or marketing platform or participation in various melas and art. So at every level, entrepreneurial, uh, entrepreneurship wing of the ministry has been uh, providing support to these uh, entrepreneurs. And uh, I would like to share with all of you that uh, the share of women entrepreneurs or uh, the share of women participants in our training program is 56%. And in our sister concern, JSS, I think the session is on tomorrow, the women participation is 82%, so which is amazing. And their presence at the rural level also. Uh, I would uh, like to say once again that the role of industry is very significant in creating awareness in collaboration with us among women so that they will become self-dependent, they will, they will uh, become uh, self-dependent, empowered and self-confident which is very important, I think. Thank you, Dr. Sinha, uh, for that insightful uh, response and I think very heartening to hear the numbers that you said, uh, you know, 56% and 80 plus percent, so very happy to hear that. So, so I think we can go on and on, but uh, maybe we can take some questions or any, any observations or thoughts anybody wants to uh, share because, you know, there is so much we all can do in our own capacity uh, in this space in terms of, you know, increasing the gender participation in the workforce. Of course, the government is making effort. It has to be a partnership between government and industry. But I'm sure all, all, all of us in our own capacity can, uh, you know, play a role. Uh, but, but before we go to the audience for questions and suggestions, I think, Mohammed, uh, you would like to share something? Last point, which I just forgot uh, to mention. So we developed, uh, maybe for the interested uh, uh, colleagues and partners here, we developed a manual on female, let's say, women in vocational training in India. So what are the best tools? This is uh, it's based on discussions with trainers from ITI, and, um, which they shared about their experience when girls are going to vocational training, what kind of challenges they are facing, and what are the possible solutions. So um, it might be interesting for, him, for, for, uh, for one or another. We will uh, share it with Vicky for, let's say, it can be shared with, uh, with yes. Absolutely, Mama, that would be wonderful. We'll be delighted to do that. So, shall we go to the questions? Questions or observations, any thoughts? And my request is to please keep it very brief and crisp so that we can cover more questions and more people. Yeah. Uh, I'm Shakti Devesa Sharma, and I have been speaking this morning. <laughs> Uh, I only have one suggestion, uh, and that is that let's look for the aptitude testing of the women. Once we know what is their aptitude level, then you know what they like, what they're capable of, how far they can go. Once they know it, once we know it, skilling and employment will not be a problem. Otherwise, one failure or one step lower and they lose their all confidence and they just sit down at home. Aptitude testing I believe is very important. Thank you. I think that's a very valuable input and you're saying one way to enable 
our women workforce is to do their aptitude testing so they know the, where they are standing and then they go for skilling, development and then join the workforce. Thank you so much for that input. Yeah. Good evening. Myself, Somnath Banerjee, co-founder and CEO for I'm Corporate Alliance Private Limited. We are into staffing, apprenticeship, and skilling. Uh, thank you, panel, for your wonderful ones, uh, insights. The biggest takeaway, of course, is that all the stakeholders, uh, either industry, government, staffing companies, academia, they want the enhancement of, uh, you know, uh, enhancement of diversity hiring, enhancement of uh, uh, employ uh, employment for women. At the same time, we have got some very good incentive schemes from government, this employment link schemes, which is there to enhance the employment as well. But then a second thought comes that if this uh, candidates don't continue for a span of a year and all, then that liability comes on the employer as read and understood by me, uh, the schemes as so far. Uh, then do you feel that, uh, is that really going to help, uh, you know, the enhancement of the employment, especially diversity hiring and all, uh, where we you know there is a lot of scope of attrition, especially for girls. There is more cause, as we understood. Uh, that's uh, how you are going to address that, both government and industry. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So you're right. Uh, as the budget speech clearly articulated that the scheme A, B, and C has a certain uh, eligibility, a certain benefit. And like you rightly said, if you do not have that person for 12 months, then there's a clawback and the clawback is on the employer. Uh, but the final rules have not been drafted. Uh, as part of the industry consultation that government is doing and we are actively involved with the government from various federations and uh, various industry bodies, we've given exactly that recommendation to the government that as long as the employer has done net addition to employment, and created more jobs linked to EPFO. If person A leaves, and that could be for genuine reasons, the employer has not asked the person to leave, that should not entitle the government to ask for the money back, because if that happens, then many of the employers will not even contribute to the scheme, will not participate in the scheme. And the way our auditors in this country work, they will insist on taking provisions before you have even started the benefits of the scheme. So allow the rules to come out, the rules are yet to come out. Uh, uh, from the government side, I can just tell you this much that they are very, very leaning towards hearing from the industry bodies such that, that any scheme which comes out should have an element of ease of doing business. So let, let it come out, I think we should be in a good position. Let's wait and watch. Thank you. Good evening, panelists. Myself, Ismail K. Bashir from Asap Kerala. I have just two, one observation and one recommendation. One uh, comment is that currently we have done a project with Women and Child Development Department, Government of Kerala, to in enroll Asian program for career break women who have career breaks, who got pregnant for a number for last three years. What we did was, was we took 100 and 110 applicants, we trained them, and then filtered them into 30 for the training program. The cost of the program was around 40 lakh rupees. And out of the 30 and uh, the 60 companies, because it was higher end training method, after our short term training program, these 100 candidates will appear before companies to get shortlisted. Out of the shortlisted, we will give further training for employment. And in that process, around six, uh, 450 students got shortlisted. So initially, we have got funded for, fund for the training of the 30, uh, 30 students. They all, all have completed their training. Currently, they are writing enrolled agent examination for your certification, your certification for US taxation. And uh, we have also been promised funds for the training of the rest of the 20 candidates who are also been shortlisted by MNC companies who are working in the financial sector. And another comment is that we have been working in education field for the last 12 years. Sometimes they get married when they are studying in colleges. But from the government side, there should be some kind of 
promotion or support if they are getting married, they should be encouraged to continue their studies, complete their graduation, even if they take one year break. The, the, uh, the comment is to improve that so that even if they take one year or six month break, break they should be easily be able to rejoin and complete their work successfully if they got married or if they are or carrying or something like that. That's all. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that uh, success story of yours as well as giving us the suggestion. So it all goes towards the enabling policies that we discussed and definitely your input is uh, well captured. Thank you so much. So good evening, uh, esteemed panelists. My name is Amita and I work with XRI Center for Gender Equality and Inclusive Leadership. My question to you is that, for example, we are talking about livelihoods and skill development and employment linked opportunities for women at grassroots. So uh, we saw one trend in Jharkhand, for example, that uh, women at grassroots are being trained for certain trades like as, uh, SMO, the XLI machine operators, and they find employment opportunities in uh, cities like uh, Tirpur, Bangalore, and you know other places. And after uh, six months or a year later, they migrate back to the state. So what kind of uh, problems these kind of uh, initiatives cause and what kind of backup plans can be you know, thought of for the women who migrate back because of uh, probably lack of uh, interest or family pressures, etc., etc. And what can be done, how entrepreneurship could be promoted for such women in the States? Thank, Thank you for your question. Thank you. Uh, wonderful question. Uh, in fact, uh, I told you that the uh, mentoring and handholding is very much important. I mean, when they go to the field, they start their own enterprise, and after starting the enterprise, they feel teething problems. Sometimes they uh, face the challenges, they uh, overcome the challenges, sometimes they may not. So at that time, the role of mentor is very much important to motivate them, encourage them, and to guide them how to start, how to grow, and how to develop. If the business will be, I mean, the growth of the business is uh, good, then definitely they will not leave the business. And of course, uh, if they want to do something in their uh, native place, there are various uh, scheme and incentive of uh, government of India as well as state government, they can start from scratch and they can uh, grow. I have uh, written success story of uh, women entrepreneurs. I mean it is mix of male and female but majority are women. They have started from scratch and they are doing very well. Uh, is Swav Lamban Ki Or. It is uh, available on uh, Nisbet website and uh, at uh, SIDH portal also, SIDH. And we have uh, success stories of such type of uh, women entrepreneur at uh, our uh, YouTube channel, PM Udyami Talk. You can uh, have a look and it will help you in motivating uh, these women because they have to face a lot of challenges and they, uh, even though they are growing very well. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, I wanted to bring in one point which has not yet been taken, is the care economy. We haven't touched the very major component of women in the care economy. What is the contribution of women in the national GDP? You know, they're working uh, at home and at workplace. So the salary is, of course, what they do, or what they earn is the earning. But we don't have any metrics for the kind of uh, hours they put in in the care economy, whether it's children or the elderly or everything. Every other country is probably putting that in place. We also were going to work on that, but I think the government should look at it. And what would be the contribution if she wasn't looking at the uh, care at home? How much would be they be spending on that? So that should be the contribution which should be added to the national deal. The second point which should be, you know, I've been working for so many years, but I still feel that this had graduated data. The data we talk about is just not authentic. After COVID, it's really changed. 
And we have to look at rural and urban in its own uh, past. Because it's very different in the rural areas as far as, you know, we can't take everything, you know, one size fits all. So if you look at rural economy, they're all self-paced. You know, they're home workers, they're based out of their homes, and there's more of entrepreneurial thing which is not being taken with the real and the unorganized. So that would be the missing area. Whereas when you go to the urban, their, uh, 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 their problems are different. Their approach is also different. They have more amenities and, uh, you know, they can scale up and scaling, as you said, is all in the urban areas. I don't find people going into the rural areas. I mean, we are grassroots workers, so we need to go there and take the modules. But the modules are need-based. They are not the modules which the NSDC makes because they don't want long modules. They want short modules and stick to what they want, as was already said. So if it's a three days or a four days or a week program, or even if it's a continuous scaling, designing, applications, packaging, marketing, it's various elements of uh, since they are self-employed. Now what happened was that uh, it's seasonal. When they're self-employed, they break up when the um, agriculture season is on. How do you see that? Because then they become wage earners. And also when they have stopped working because of certain reasons like the calamities, then they, you know, they're looking for jobs. So they go and then uh, enroll themselves as job seekers. So there is this entire thing when, you know, we were just working on a census, which is going to come out now next year. And these are the data we need, because without data, how would you make a policy? And then that's why it doesn't reach out to the people. It's all need-based, number one. Number two, you have to do the job to the capital, where you what they need. And what is the, uh, you know, it's not, again, the module has to be based on what they want. And it could be, you know, the advanced skilling reasoning because they have basic skills. Now, what is it you want to give them much for? Or we have to give them what is the uh, requirement of the market As uh, you also said, that market related uh, uh, enterprise. So those are the kind of things. Another thing, point was on the glass seal. Why women are not up the ladder after certain years? All those problems which you said, when the uh, priorities in the house, things like that. But um, uh, when touched on that when they get back after the maternity, that they start from where they left uh, out, that's a very important point because usually they get back on that. And that's the reason they don't uh, join the workforce again. Yes, so, so look at that. I mean, that's only one organization which is doing, but is it rampant in every other organization? Another point which came to my mind is why women are more in the traditional sector? Why are they not moving into the high-tech area? So STEM, I think, is an important thing. So STEM is where we should write across, whether they are learned, educated or not. But technology is a very important good one. Yeah. So thank you so much. I think very valid uh, four points. But just one more thing I want to share, which um, I, I think we've not covered so far, and I keep uh, telling this to all the young women who come in our workforce, both at uh, you know at a permanent job kind of a thing, or even at shop floor. Sometimes it's all in our own mind, in the minds of the women. We we never feel uh, that we are ready. Never ask for opportunities. Never ask for help. So, for example, we spoke about maternity. You know, one of the things I said, there is no harm in asking that you need help, you need support, you need a break. You want flexibility to work from home. Sometimes the organizations will come together. They may not have a policy, but if women ask for it, exceptions would be made and ultimately they become policies. So sometimes I think more of mentoring and coaching and you know reaching out to the women at the grassroots and telling them that you have equal rights. You have opportunity to be participating in the workforce and take up opportunities. There's government supporting you, industry is supporting you, but maybe more coaching, mentoring of the women themselves, saying, you know, how you can take charge of your lives, your career, how you want to move up. You know, so, so sometimes, I mean, I see it at leadership levels all the time. We wait till we are 100% ready and don't offer opportunities. But, but I'm sure it's there down the line as well. So I think, Nikki, we've run out of time and we've taken quite a few thoughts and questions. Uh, are we good to close? So great, uh, we've had a great session and I really thank all our esteemed panel members. Uh, Dr. Kocher was wonderful interacting with you. Mohamed, thank you. I, I had to one, one question which is, uh, I be Sorry. crucial yes. if yes, you please permit. Go ahead. Please go thank ahead. you. I'm Dr. Rajiv Kumar Jain. I'm chair of the scientific committee 
on education and training in occupational health at the International Commission on Occupational Health. Uh, when uh, uh, seeing all the session topics, this session appeared to be the most promising for the country. Because unless you focus on how uh, women force participate in the labor, uh, substantive change will not happen. We all know that. Now, on the dis discussion since morning, I was wondering, are we talking about 8% of our labor force or 92% of labor force? All data in India is very clearly showing that we are still 92% unorganized sector and 8%, only 8%, all the Viki members together constitute only 8% of the labor force. So are we talking about 8% or are we talking about 92%? Part 1. Part 2. When we discuss about EPFO-based data, it leaves out the bottom substantive population of the labor force, which they are, they are covered by EPFO. It requires the, the, the organization should be having more than 10 or 20 employees to be part of the EPFO base. But the most of the industries, the real industry in India, is less than 10 employees, less than 20 employees. Have we studied those? Are there any initiatives for upskilling that crucial sector? Because only that, that will write the story for the world. Only that will change the south of the world. The Africa, or Latin America, or Asian continent. India will be the leader. If India aspires to the big power. Can we talk about the left out? None in the hall at present. I don't hear them because they are not present. So when we talk of this labor force participation, specific reference to women participation, the crucial sector, which is the unorganized sector, and the people who are still entering, huge number will also continue to remember, enter the informal sector instead of the organized sector. So this formalization of the informal sector. And my question to the chair, uh, sorry for uh, issue, because you are heading uh, one of the important committees in the PK, uh, Vedanta Resources and Multinational Organizations. Whatever you practice will be percolating down other future organizations like Vedanta Resources. What action Vedanta Resources have taken to formalize formalize the major non-formal in the area that you work in. Thank you. No, thank you so much and uh, you know I'll encourage my other panel members to add in case they want to add. But you know I did not cover in detail but if you go to the if you go to the areas of where we have our factories, where we have our plants, more and enough, I would say we are touching 92%. 8% ha happens automatically. There are policies, there are processes, there are programs for 8% which are well established. We don't even need to work on it. So just to give you an example, even before the six-month maternity benefit became an act, Vedanta was a company which introduced six-month maternity leave six months before it became an act. So what I'm saying is in terms of people practices, in terms of benchmarking with the best globally, we are number one. So 8% is taken care of, I don't even need to worry. The 92% that you're talking about is covered by all our businesses. So, I mean, there are enough programs. So, for example, if you look at aluminium, which is there in Archar, which is there in Jharkhand, which is there in Chhattisgarh, which is there in Orissa, our steel plants are there. There are enough programs which are being done through CSR. We have CSR budgets of 500 crore, all put together, all our businesses put together. So, there are enough programs which are happening in terms of upskilling the women. I spoke about Nandhar program. I don't know whether you were there in the room when I spoke about that. We are touching. We have committed to touch 2 crore women and these are not women who are 8%. We are talking about women who are part of the 92% that you spoke about. So those eight, 2 crore women will come to the front line and we are talking about, you know, some one of my esteemed panel members spoke about taking the jobs to them rather than, you know, skilling them. They coming back after 2-3 years, getting into the family way and all of those things. But we are creating jobs where they are. I mean, these jobs could be in terms of uh, anything. For example, handicrafts, these jobs could be in, uh, you know, uh, we, we get women in the Nandgars who are trained and upskilled on various things. It could be on garment manufacturing technology, it could be on various, various uh, programs. Uh, the local, local uh, uh, stuff which is there, it could be, you know, pickle making, basics like that. 
So 92% is being touched upon, which is being touched upon by Vedanta resources, which is just one drop in the ocean. It is just one company. I'm sure each person sitting in this company, each of my panel members will have several examples. And at, I, in the first session, some, somebody spoke about it, saying why we can wait for government to make policies, and government is doing their bit, but industry has to take a lead. We have to do it with a purpose. We have to do it with a vision. If we keep waiting, say, if a policy comes, a mandate comes, I will do it. It should not be driven by mandate. It should be driven, driven by a desire to do it. Sorry, you addressed the question directly to me, so I am answering you directly covering with Amta Resources as well. But even as my picky co-chair, I mean, I can vouch for it saying that each one of us needs to take that responsibility and account of it. Very relevant question. Uh, in fact, we are also encouraging our trainees, participants, uh, to uh, do uh, Aadhaar Udyam registration and we are also telling them to uh, come to informal to formal so that they can avail uh, maximum benefit of the government. Of course, uh, in fact, evaluation study has not been done, but in our uh, training program awareness campaign, we are encouraging them. We have also uh, done one study. Uh, it is available on our website, how to bring these uh, uh, informal to formal. It is very interesting. It would help. And, uh, of course, the government of India is uh, providing a lot of benefit to uh, those entrepreneurs who are uh, registered with them. We are encouraging our participants. Of course, uh, there is a need to do a lot. So I think uh, we've overshooted in terms of time, but uh, quickly to summarize, I, I think this was a very interesting session and a very important session for all of us. And then thank you for participation, thank you for all the energy from the audience as well. But we spoke about the industry and government partnership, we spoke about what policies we could bring, uh, you know, to enable our uh, uh, women participation in workforce. And I think uh, our panel members spoke about, you know, how there is enough study which says the productivity of the companies or the profitability of the countries goes up if there is equal participation of women in the workforce. So, so I think together, I mean, it's just the, uh, the good part is that we are all conscious about it. We are all aware of it. And in our own spaces, along with government support, picky support, I, I think we can definitely take it to the next level. And as we progress over the years, I, we have a lot of programs that FICI has also already lined up, but we don't have to wait for FICI or government to come up, but I think industry has to take a lead in this and then go to and touch upon the 92% that uh, Sir you spoke about. So thank you so much. Uh,